Cisco's routers and switches are typically managed through SSH, but by default, they don't actually support SSH. Now you don't have to install any additional software for this, but you do actually have to configure them. So how do you configure Cisco IOS, for instance, to give you secure remote SSH access to a device? Well, if that's something you're interested in finding out, then stick around and watch this video, because that's what we'll be going over. Now I'm going to make an assumption that the device is either brand new, in other words, it's just out of the box, or it's actually being repurposed and the configuration has been reset back to the factory defaults. In either case, like here, we're connected into the console port and we're being asked if we actually want to enter the initial configuration um, by going through this dialogue process. So in my case, I don't really want to do that. In fact, I never do that. So I'm going to type in no and hit return. We'll just give it a while. And then what it'll do is it'll take us back to the command prompt and then we'll start to configure it from there. Now, in order to get SSH access to this router that I've got as an example, we're going to have to configure some key pairs first. But when it comes to these Cisco devices, in order to actually generate key pairs, you need to configure a domain name. But while we're at it, we're going to change the host name because the default of router doesn't really make much sense. So we're going to go into enable mode. And we're going to do our configuration through the terminal. So I'm just going to paste in a command to change the host name. And what you use is, you know, the actual naming conventions and tie it to you or the company you work for. I then need to set the domain name. Notice this actual command, it, it begins with IP. It doesn't begin with domain name. It begins with IP, then domain name. So in my case, I'm just calling this syscallab.lan. And then now we can actually generate the key pairs that we're going to use. So I'll just paste the command in for that. So it's crypto key generate. In this case, we're going to use RSA, which is the typical um, algorithm that you use. Then we've got the modular size. We're setting it to 4096 bits, but you can use a different size if you want. Because it's going to be used for management purposes only, I'm quite happy to set it to a size like that because I don't really expect that many SSH sessions. Typically for the sort of companies I've worked with, there's usually like a small team, even if they're managing an entire um, set of devices around the, uh, the actual globe, the actual network team does tend to be quite small anyway, so you don't get that many concurrent SSH sessions. So I'll just hit return and then off it goes and creates its key pairs. Now, in order to be able to gain access to a device using SSH, you need to be able to log into it. In which case, we need to create a user account. Unfortunately, these Cisco devices do actually have their own local database that we can use. So I'm going to paste in a command that creates a new user account. I'll just go back to the start of the actual command here. And what we've got is username, which is the actual command. Then I've called this user Cisco, although obviously it would make a lot more sense to use something more, more relevant to yourself. Uh, but that's just a typical sort of user account for labs. I'm going to set the privilege level for this user to 15. This just basically saves me having to go through the normal process of logging in with a privilege level of one and then elevating that privilege to level 15 using the enable uh, command. Um, over the years, I can't honestly say I've seen that many people or companies actually bother with privilege levels to set uh, different permissions for different commands to be able to uh, give certain people low level read access, for example, but it is there if you want to. I just like to keep things simple. And in this particular case, we're just going to set that privilege level of 15 as part of the actual uh, creation of the account anyway. Now, when it comes to the creation of these accounts, bear in mind that the details are being stored in the actual configuration file. And if that configuration ever gets out, well, it's going to have the password actually stored for that user as well. But what we can do is we can actually encrypt that password within the configuration. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to set the algorithm uh, type that we're going to be using for that encryption to SHA-256 to, uh, to actually make it a bit more stronger. And then that means we'll use the secret parameter to say we want to encrypt this password. Now, obviously, while you're actually putting that password in, it's in plain text, as you can see. But once it's actually stored, 
well then it gets encrypted so it does make a lot more sense to use something a lot more complicated than what i'm using i'm just keeping this um, as simple as possible for the video so i'm just going to hit return and then off that goes and it creates our actual user account that we can use to log in with now because this router that i'm using was reset back to its factory default settings i also need to give it an ip address so that i can reach it over the network so here we're in configuration mode and I need to tell it which interface we want to actually configure. So I'll just paste in that specific interface. So it's interface G0 slash zero. So that's gigabit ethernet zero slash zero for this device. I'll hit return. I'll then need to give it an IP address and that has to be done in decimal format for the Cisco iOS uh, operating system. So IP address using a private IP address range uh, for my labs. And then this is just your typical slash 24 network. Now, again, it varies across the platforms in that some devices will have the interface shut by default, others will leave it open. So just to be on the safe side, we're actually gonna make sure that this interface is actually operating. So I'm gonna paste in a command no shutdown just to make sure that the interface isn't actually shut. And then that should make uh, sure that the interface is available on the network and I should be able to then re actually reach it remotely from my computer. Now it might vary depending on the version of operating system you're running but chances are you also need to allow remote access to your device. If I look at this one in particular uh, and look at its running configuration starting with the word line it'll come back and give me the running configuration uh, starting with the console, but what I'm interested in is here where it's got lines VTY 0 to 4, so that's uh, the five terminal lines that we've got. We've got a command of login, but we don't have a password. So it does allow logins on these lines, but without a password you can't gain remote access. It's also got the transport input protocol setting set to none, meaning you can't even gain uh, Telnet access to this device. So we need to make some additional changes. We only want to allow SSH access, but we do want uh, remote access and we'd want to actually use the local database for our authentication so we'll go into configuration mode and I'm going to actually create some additional uh, lines while I'm at it because typically you've got 16 lines so I'll just paste that in so I've got line BTY0 uh, to 15 we want local authentication so instead of login we have login local and then I want to set that transport input protocol specifically to SSH so it'll allow SSH and that's it so that sets us up to allow remote access to this actual device now normally at this stage I would be doing some basic testing just to make sure that I can get remote access to this router using SSH the only trouble is that the encryption algorithms have actually moved on and in fact some are actually even deprecated and that means I'm going to have to make some changes to both the computer I use as well as this Cisco device. I mean, I do want to actually lock the actual security settings down to make things harder. And it does make sense to actually test things first before you do that. It's just that things are out of sync. In which case, I may as well jump ahead as far as configuring the actual router is concerned. And then when I make my changes on the computer, they should work. So we're in configuration mode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock this down to allow SSH version 2 only. By default, it will be able to support version 1, which we don't want. So we're going to force it to only accept version 2 uh, sessions. And then what I'm going to do is lock down the algorithms uh, that we're going to allow. And the ones I've got are pretty much the best I can get. Unfortunately, uh, they're a bit outdated still. So I'm just going to paste all these in. So these are the different algorithms that are being recommended at the moment, at least. So we can get as far as like SHA-2, uh, 256, for example, for our uh, Mac algorithm. Uh, for the encryption, we can get AES-256. The only catch is when it comes to the key exchange, we've only got Diffie-Hellman Group 14 and SHA-1. And I know my computer will not like that because OpenSSH, which is what I'm using on my Linux computer, has moved on. So that's why I'm making sure that I at least get that part done here first. And then while I'm here, I'm also going to increase the key size for Diffie-Hellman as well. 
we'll set that to 4096. So that's at least increased um, the level of encryption uh, algorithms that we can go as far as. I mean, if I go back to select the key exchange one, for instance, uh, just to give you an example. You see, it's not really giving me any alternatives than SHA-1, so I'm kind of stuck with that. But what these will do is it just, it, they're intended basically just to make sure that we don't accept weaker encryption algorithms because this device will it'll support a lot of algorithms and we want to make it as difficult as possible um, for an actual hacker, for example, uh, to be able to take advantage of weaker algorithms. And at this stage, this is the best we've got. Now I'm going to be using a Linux computer to gain remote access to this Cisco router. And for that reason, I've got a terminal session open. If I type in ssh 172.16.22.50, so that's the IP address of the router, hit return, and it's coming back and complaining that there's no matching key exchange method found. That is the actual key exchange that we set up on that router. It's the best one I could get. The only trouble is OpenSSH has actually moved on and it's not even going to actually try to use that. So we have to reconfigure the computer here to allow us to use that. So I've already done that. I've just commented the settings out, but I need to edit this config file uh, for SSH. I'll just take the comments out. So I've got some settings here specifically for that uh, router that we've got. So that's the host entry that I'm calling and I could have called this whatever I like. This is just what I'll be using to reference it as. And since I've actually got a name on the router, I'd like to keep it in sync. Uh, I'm not using any DNS here, so I've got an IP address uh, to reference. I could actually you know, put a username in here if I wanted to. Not really recommended in case somebody gets a hold of these uh, configuration settings. But for the sake of this lab, I'm just going to keep my life a bit easier. Then what I've got to do is I've got to basically downgrade the connection. So we've got to set a key exchange algorithm plus the actual host key algorithm so that these will work. If you don't use these two settings, you'll, you'll just get uh, errors like we did before. So we're going to save those changes. If I now type SSH UK, just tab that out because it's the only uh, one I've got to find in that config file. Hit return. Um, and wants to know if we're going to accept the fingerprints. I'll just type in yes to say I will. I need to put in the password. And there we go. We've now got remote SSH access into that device. Because I actually set the user uh, account to privilege level 15, you can see how the prompts are hash. And in other words, we're already at level 15 privilege. So that gets our basic SSH connectivity working. Well, at this stage, we've now got our SSH working, but I do want to add just a few more lines just to make it that bit more secure. So the first thing we're going to do is to create an access list. So I'll just copy and paste this one in. So this is just a standard worded access list. In other words, we're just defining a source IP address. And this is for the 172.16.22.0 slash 24 network. So that's a, a wild card mask um, that gets used in these sort of configurations. And it's basically just the inverse of a subnet mask. I now need to apply that to our terminal lines. And we want this to find as inbound so that it applies to inbound connections to the router. So basically what that means is if, if somebody tries to connect to this router and their computer doesn't have an IP address in this subnet, the router won't even let them attempt to log in. And then while I'm here on the lines, I'm also going to time out idle sessions with the exec timeout command. So I've set that to 10 minutes. What you want to use is entirely up to you. By default, it doesn't time out any sessions at all. And the problem with that is that you've only got 16 terminal lines here. We could add more. But by timing out idle sessions, you're like, uh, less likely to run into a situation where you've just got no more terminal lines left. And that means you just can't get remote access to this computer anymore. So that is very useful in the sense that if somebody connects into the actual router, um, you know, locks up their computer at the end of the day, goes home, and then this what will happen is this session, because the actual session was uh, idle, will get disconnected after 10 minutes in this case. 
I'm also going to limit the number of authentication attempts. Now, this is not particularly uh, sophisticated. All it's doing is it's just basically going to disconnect a session that's constantly trying to log in. So if you've got like an automated computer and it's just trying to brute force passwords, basically, it's going to let you try one login attempt. And then if you don't get that login correct, in other words, don't put the correct password in, it's going to give you three more attempts than disconnect your session. Normally what would happen is it would just keep letting you try and try and try, which is terrible for like an automated um, attempt to brute force a password. Uh, that's not something ideal, but this is pretty basic, but it's still better than nothing. What I'm also going to do is put in a setting here for the keep alive. So that applies both inbound and outbound. That's to do with half open connections, orphan connections. The idea is if, if a session doesn't quite complete or if it's deliberate in case of an attempt to do denial of service, these do have keep lives going and it'll eventually clear them out. Otherwise, you run the risk of the actual device uh, running into a situation where it just runs out of connections, which isn't good. Um, so again, pretty basic to put in. Then the last thing I'm actually going to put in is to actually enable SCP because we've actually configured uh, SSH on this device. Now, normally you would probably be using things like TFTP to transfer files, and that could include the configuration, which isn't really good because you want everything encrypted. So because we've enabled SSH, you may as well enable the SCP server, so that way you can get a, a remote session into this computer using SSH as the tunneling protocol uh, to encrypt your transfers, basically. So that gives us a, an hour remote connection using SSH into this computer. It's been locked down as best we can, given what we've got on this device in terms of algorithms and so on. It could be better, but you are basically limited to what the actual operating system is capable of. And at least we've gone as far as restricting who can get access and tie things up that bit more just for your typical working network. Well, thanks for making it to the end of this video. I really do hope you found it useful. If so, then do click the like button and share as that'll help get the video out to more people who might find it useful as well. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please post those in the comments section below. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, then yes, do subscribe. Just remember to set the bell icon to actually send you notifications when new content gets released. Although I also post to Twitter as well as Facebook. If you'd like to help the channel and support it, you can actually make contributions through PayPal and buy me a coffee. I've also got links to Patreon and there's also the join membership option for YouTube itself. Patreon and YouTube members do have the option to actually benefit from early access as well. But above all, many thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.